You need to be afraid, otherwise you're not doing it right. If you think, okay, that's gonna be fun and cozy. No, it's gonna hurt. That's why you're doing it. That's the fun, that's not cozy. So if it feels safe, if you don't feel that friction or the confidence that that friction can be okay, uh, you're not doing the, the future. You're doing something else. I don't know what that is, coasting. You know? yeah. uh, so so <laughs> even if it looks downhill, it's not. Martin Wazowski is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Martin works as Chief Futurist for SAP's Technology and Innovation. He is lecturing as a faculty member of Future I.O., also a fellow colleague of mine at Future I.O., a European Future Institute and other education programs. He has moved across a wide range of disciplines from user experience to systemic design to define innovation, visions, and strategies. Right now, he is on the mission to map, build, and inspire a future we want to live in. More specifically, he crafts future outlooks, concepts, products, defines and runs innovation frameworks to find out what's next and beyond for SAP's vast ecosystem and the future of work. 2017, he was named one out of 100 most innovative minds in Germany as the software visionary. I want to innovate that, that what we call work out of our lives via an empathetic symbiosis between human ingenuity and machine intelligence. So eloquently said, Martin. Um, <laughs> I am so glad to have you here on, on the show. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's been a while since we've been together. But yeah. uh, I, 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 how have you been? Hey, I've been, you know, growing my hair, as you can see. <laughs> Bringing back my instruments from the basement. Uh, I don't know, extending my kitchen utensils collection and many other things, you know, writing I've, strategies for, for, for SCP as well and some visions. So I, all I, that. I believe it. I, I, you, defi man. I definitely see that you haven't slowed down a bit, but I want, I want to go even deeper into that, that, that very question we just had. So you are a futurist, a visionary. You've been doing this for numerous years. Um, um, and first of all, I need to let our listeners know that you and I know each other for, from a ways back now through Kinternet. And we actually have had a, a lot of fun times in Avalon and, and in France at Kinternet and enjoyed some car rides to the airport and, yeah. and many, many other fabulous experiences and, and shared the stage before all, all over the place. And, uh, uh, uh so that's first and foremost, but because you've been doing this, this future work, this thinking about the futures, the visions and all this, has it given you a little bit of resilience to weather all this crazy shit that the world is seeing? So not just the, the pandemic and COVID, Black Lives Matters, the crazy mm. US election, Belarus, the Brexits, the Putins, the Shays, the Bolsonaros, and all other the tumultuous things that were we've seen gone on uh, in the last, you know, 12 months or more. How, how have you weathered? Has it given you resilience or, or how have you been? Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. I've been thinking about it. It, it. It's yes. I mean, the simple answer is yes, because I believe that's a little bit of my job. If, if you know, if someone asked me, uh, what's, what's my mission? What, what am I here for? <laughs> Besides your occupation and whatever we do, you and I and everybody else listening, um, it is perhaps the, the, the ability that I can use. So, so I need to make it to my mission, you know, a little bit of my purpose to <clears throat> to build and inspire sort of exactly that resilience, exactly that future belief. That, and, and in the end, it is a creative confidence that I, whoever you are, and me and you as well, Mark, can create futures. So to have a confidence that we can do that is the first step almost to... to <clears throat> to take any any action there because it's going to hurt um you know i usually say that the future is an action sport 
if it feels if you if you're standing on top of the mountain you're just going down you have your bike you have your you know springs working you have everything you have like carbon frame everything for for you know four thousand you need to be afraid otherwise you're not doing it right if you think okay that's going to be fun and cozy no it's going to hurt that's why you're doing it that's the fun that's not cozy so if it feels safe if you don't feel that friction or the confidence that that friction can be okay uh you're not doing the, the future you're doing something else i don't know what that is coasting you know? yeah. uh, so so even if it looks downhill it's not so that, that gives you the resilience uh, it must if, if i would say no honestly to you i have not been doing my job so i guess that's one way to look at it. what do you think uh, i definitely uh know that you're doing your job and not only do you have that vision of the future but you apply it in your life and and i and, and you said it so eloquently it's really about leaving the comfort zone that you've got mm. it to get into that flow state you there's got to be a certain amount of fear and anxiety yeah. high high alertness to what's coming and where you're going because you're moving at a, at a different pace and so you've you've got to watch for the bumps and and, and the jolts but uh but you have all the tools at your facility to act and react on and i and I, so nicely you you got the guitars out of the basement but <laughs> I, I see a nice work-life uh, balance. And so that, that is something that we'll definitely get into as well um, today in our conversation that for many years, I mean, you've been talking about the humans of new work and, and the future of work for, for decades now, really, and <laughs> actually working on the tools and the things for the future. But ha haven't those two things, work and life, been kind of moving in opposite directions for many times kind of been polar opposites for many of us like we're like i'm living for the weekend let's go <laughs> for the weekend and then others are like i don't have a weekend because yeah, exactly. i'm always working and and that you know uh, you know there's the mondays there's the fridays but they're always kind of pulling against each other they're never mm -hmm. fully aligned how, how yeah. do you feel about that and, and what can you tell us about those two opposites I mean, I feel I feel as everybody else. I think uh, both the sides of what you just said. That's that's the short, but it's a simple everyday answer. However, I have this principle. Why I think it's okay. Either way, it goes to to a little bit to overdrive. Uh, I can still be cool. Okay, I'm living only for the weekend. I don't have a, still be cool because I I have this large goal. I guess <clears throat> this utopia. It's a vision. I see this that. Imagine this, Mark, and everybody else. Can you just imagine that all the words we have forgotten? I mean, from old school agriculture. I mean, what some people, most people don't know what it's called when you make butter with a big churning, wooden stick. Yeah. Churning butter. I mean, why why to carry that with you? You forgot that word, you, you didn't obviously. We, we don't churn butter anymore. And if we use it, 90% of us. <clears throat> wouldn't know what it actually means. We just use it because we learned that that is churning money. Okay. The word work, I think, goes down in the same history of old words we don't understand anymore. So, so there will be grandchildren saying, Mark, what does work mean again? <laughs> and you would have to explain what a crazy idea it was that we actually had the separation of that time. Uh, what we will call it, I don't know. I think we will call it life uh, because yeah, like living, having a day, <laughs> having a week, because just being us is exactly to, to translate this um, passion. And, and I think more people will have a vision of what they're doing with a week, with a month, with their lives, maybe, who, who knows? And the, and the passion about it. And the, when they com out, combine this, they will feel that they have a purpose. When they execute on that purpose, where? then they live their lives. Today, some parts of that we call work because it's so dedicated to a place, which by the way, was totally screwed up this year. The place of, we can talk about that too. A time, which also was totally screwed up. All of a sudden it's two in the morning, you're doing your best work because, well, you can. Nobody knows the meetings in the morning and you won't be in the meeting, right? You see what I'm saying? The mix of that, I think, reveals my long-term uh, vision of what, what your question proposes here. No, I want to design out the word work out of our lives because life is enough. 
if that's if that's a perspective to to grab on to i i hope people think so yeah i mean in your quote that i read you know i want to innovate what we call work out of our lives via an empathetic symbiosis between human ingenuity and machine intelligence i mean it couldn't be better said now here here's the practical part of that and i'm going to call, <laughs> call you on the carpet how in the hell do we design it out of our lives? Because it's been decades we've been stuck in, in the dark <laughs> ages or the industrial revolution of this thing called work, punching a clock, you know, 40 hours a week, sometimes 80 hours. A lot of us define our lives by our work. Is there, you don't have to give away the kitchen sink here, but are there some tools, some things that, that you're working on that we need to move towards, start to think about as a, more the human experience. Are there tools? Are there different paradigm shifts? What What are some of the things that you can give us hope for, to look towards? I mean that, that that's exactly yeah. You you you're asking the right question because otherwise, if you don't ask the question from that perspective, you, one could assume that this is impossible. Yeah, but that's utopia. Okay, so we can talk about that as well. I I, I think every utopia has a dutopia preceding it things we need to do to make the utopia happen. And obviously on the totally other side, far before utopia, there is a dystopia. Oh no, we will just work harder and we will die. Okay, so, so I, I don't like that. So I don't work for that vision, the dystopia. I do the utopia to reach the, this, uh, uh, to reach the utopia, which is actually that we don't consider some of our doings being work and some of them something else. So, Dutopia means finding tools and methodologies. It becomes, you know, like the police says, you know, it's not magic, it's just police work. You have to knock the doors. You have to interview the neighbors. You, you, <laughs> that's not romantic at all. It's just foot work. And I think uh, we forget that I'm not romanticizing anything. And the tools are basically in two classes. I think what I mentioned when I say they're, symbiotic so empathic symbiosis between machine intelligence and human ingenuity these are the tools and if you marry them work will sort of dissolve not disappear that's bullshit it will dissolve into our lives and we will call it life we will like it that will be the the vision and the passion that equals purpose and the tools are roughly said automation uh, on one side of the stuff that we find um, you know, and I, I, I've used this word on purpose, subhuman, because it's provoking. Um, and it pro should provoke us to think, hmm, if I have my integrity, a self-worth as a human, what would be below me? Do it for yourself first, so you don't, you know, upset someone or yourself, or when you upset yourself, oh shit, that's actually below me. I'm doing it all the time, but put it down. How, usually it's boring, repetitive. It's usually, long or, or so, large numbers, amounts, and so on. We know, you, you know what I mean. Can that be automated? If, I, if someone said, if, I, if you can describe for me what you're doing right now in nine bullets, I can automate it because descriptions are programs. You're basically, you know, executing a computer program. We have machines for that. So automation is a big part of the, of the work that I, don't think it belongs to, to, to human worthiness or integrity anymore. That's one set of tools. Uh, let's call them machine intelligence or automation in that sense. And then we have the, the second set of tools that will help us in this marriage of, of, of human ingenuity and machine intelligence that you know dissolves work into our lives and, 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 and purpose instead. And it is uh, augmentation. So, so you, you and, and that's if the other one was below you, subhuman this is this is above you this is why i can't do it yet it's superhuman okay sub and super <clears throat> and it's superhuman in a way where it's hard it's it's ununderstandable for a human brain it's out, out of reach uh, me wearing glasses the best example this is superhuman ability i'm augmented with pair of glasses i can oh damn you look good mark you know that is <laughs> that, that thing and might look better back. if you take them back off, though. <laughs> I'm squinting a little bit all the time. No, but this this is really important. Uh, Google Maps make us do superhuman things, and since it's so mundane today, we forget what superhuman can be. It can actually be very, very simple. 
but it is still magic, technological magic. I appreciate these moments, guys, uh, when you actually could order uh, something to, to deliver to your neighbor because they are sick in COVID and you just wait, there's no problem for me. Just go online and you order it, it arrives and you knock their door. Hey, I made a stew for you. That's actually something you could have not done just 50 years ago. Uh, or yeah, shorter, 15 years ago, you could have not, because the richness of that stew cannot be contained in anything you can have gathered without leaving the home and still having job. That's superhuman, it's magic. It arrives at your fingertips. Okay, I'm spinning out of control, but you, you see my point here. But basically now, you're like covering the, the four A's, right? Exactly, that, that's a little bit like that. Two, two more to go, so I want them all. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make you, Are you thinking the like kitchen seat. <laughs> so so yeah you know we we've been working on the four a's um, in, in in a way so the four a's was or aligned with the augmentation and automation so there is the automation of routines functions processes you have in your work why do we spend our times you know controlling our record we have controllers we have administrators we do that work you and i control and administrate our work for example this podcast didn't make it itself you had to sit down and you know make it happen now imagine that in conglomerations and entrepreneurs and 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 enterprises lives many of that time is waste of energy i mean also energy um, like Earth's energy that we put into these tasks. We travel around, we meet people, we fly around the globe to make just administration happen. You must be kidding me. <laughs> An algorithm can do that for you. Sit at home, have a coffee. Um, a simplification, but obviously it makes sense. If you have a big production of, I don't know, on an automotive line, why do you have people running around and checking bolts and screws? No, we have machine vision for that. That's automation. That, that's simple to understand. And again, once anybody sits down for five minutes, they can write down a couple of things they do per day that I wish I had them too. Couldn't that be done automatically? And it can, and it, more of that can. And that's what we work with. That's the first A, automation. The second way, A, it's a little bit more complex because if this was a little bit like a business operations and processes as a service or life operations and services as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a service, operations as a service. If you order something, if you eat a lot of, I don't know, coconut yogurt, <laughs> because that's your favorite vegan dish in the morning, why don't we know you're out of it? And news, new or comics will never go hungry. Also depending on how you lead your life on Mondays less, but on Fridays you really dive into that can of coconut because that should be also automated. So from your everyday to big enterprise systems. Second A is more on a self-organizing. And by that, I mean autonomous. And autonomy is a beautiful world because also touches what we know autonomy from politics to be. Or organizations, right? Or free minds, let's put it like that. And I believe that this is more an ecosystem as a service. Today, you and I, to make, to make good business, to fulfill our purpose, to convince others that this is great, business is an adventure, of course. Tag along. I'm on a train on this adventure. You want to tag along on my business? Hey, it's your business now too. You know how we say, it's none of your business. I mean it almost like this. Dude, now it's your business too. You make it take care of it. It's an ecosystem as a service. This is also hard. I can imagine big companies like PepsiCo, Nestle, and we can go, the big ones, right? How do they know if that lady uh, owning two hectares of coffee plantage is somewhere in Ethiopia? It's probably the best coffee in the world, by the way, right? You can just imagine oh, yeah. that Ethiopian high hill coffee. That, yeah, go for it. A hipster would pay 15 euro down the street here in Berlin. I'm in Berlin, folks, by the way. Uh, down the street, 15 euro per that espresso. She gets, she gets 0.1 euro for that coffee. And most of them, they, they drink themselves. Uh, because he can't sell, Nestle doesn't know about her. She doesn't know about Nestle because their algorithm haven't met. I think that autonomy could happen. So she just can focus on making coffee and having a family there, <laughs> enjoying that. If she gets 15 euro per, per one kilo and three euro per, per other kilo, she's still okay with that. She's in the business. 
she has the out, out see what I'm saying? These people, and they should be in the millions rather than in the thousands like today. There shouldn't be only 500 factories or something. There should be 500 million interconnected, autonomous ecosystems of ecosystems speaking to each other only when they need. Otherwise, they just focus on your passion. You do your mango there in Amazonas. That mango is sweet. You do your coffee there. That coffee is unique because that's what you're passionate about. Connect this sitting on the phone, forget it. And the same goes for businesses. Why do not parts order themselves when they start to wear out? Why do they not order themselves in a better way? Because they were not environmentally friendly produced. They were not produced to last and so on. Now the engineering has advanced. Why don't they speak to engineering algorithms? Okay, so that is a little bit of a deep dive in the second day, the autonomy view, ecosystem as a service. And for me, the autonomy and automation or machine intelligences. This is things that usually humans do less good. Let's put it like that. Machines are better at it. So they help us. And we think that it's boring in the end or maybe just repetitive or just damn hard because it takes time. So that's the first part there. Does, does it still make sense before we move on? Still, uh, should we still move on to another? Uh, uh, what uh, do you think? Absolutely, it makes sense. And um, yeah, we, I mean, we definitely like to hear about all four A's because there, there are some fabulous tools or you can just say, I've teased you enough. There's a lot more. Let's let's make a deep dive uh, uh, in some of my other talks and and, and, and writings that, that you have uh, around the world because you actually do this uh, quite a bit. This is your A and O and your, I mean, that could lead to another question. So it's up to you. If you want to answer the last two A's, that's, that's fine. Or we can even take a deeper dive on, on the big why, why, you know, okay, yeah, your job as chief designer and SAP and futurist, but that's not why you do it. No, it's not because you get the paycheck. There's, the, there's a higher why, why you're doing this or what, what you're hoping to achieve uh, you know, whether it's the Simon, your Simon Sinek's why or, or, or your purpose for, for doing this type of evangelism is much higher. So I'm going to leave the choice up to you whether we go move on or if you want to answer the last two A's. Uh, that's cool. You know, I, I will do both by answering them. Uh, and the reason is this. Um, I think we sometimes I even express it as, you know, it's not that the second phase is are about augmentation, both of them. It's abundance of us, if you wish. That's, that's the two A's. We are so plenty. Uh, we haven't discovered it yet. Uh, so sometimes I even say, you know, maybe if we do it right, if I do the, my why right, maybe we can become, you know, human at last because we haven't been that yet, not to fully, uh, full extent. And to do that, we need to, rediscover, re, um, how to say, extract it from us sometimes and sometimes add it. So amplify and uh, augment. These two things come, all of them are ace, by the way. And when we do this by, by glasses or Google Maps or by telling me, hey, Martin, you know, you all, here comes this situation again. You're going into that budget negotiations for this beloved project to get these parts done like that and more environmental friendly, whatever. You will lose again because you, we see a pattern here. Try this, call your mom, call your old body from the last work you had and make a T. These three things together, we have noticed across the last three years following you as a friend, as a digital friend, help you to get different kind of budgets without fighting for it. And you go, really? Yeah, these are patterns the human brain can't see because they are so disconnected really. And you cannot see causality, see them. Even if you see some patterns that they follow, you cannot be sure if they are causing each other. I tell you to 99% certainty, they do. I want to augment you, amplify you with that knowledge. T, mom, friend, now, okay, go. Because the meeting is one hour <laughs> and you do it. So this would be one case when I am now augmented to walk into that meeting besides obviously all the information, the papers, the data that I have to spend the time fine because that comes from automation. We just already covered that. That is presented. I have my situational resume in front of me, which otherwise takes work. Wait, I need that before the meeting. No, 
You don't. It's done. It's in front of you. I have automated and augmented and amplified and all these good things to walk into that meeting with a smile. I feel confident. I can focus on why I'm talking about stuff in, instead of how to say it to convince you. I, if I do it, I do it in a friendly way. So that's a, diff, that's a personal augmentation. I am now ready to work. But there's another augmentation that comes to entities. Can a company or a, or, a, or a conglomeration of people of any kind of interest be augmented in their decision making? So a legal entity, I think they can. Absolutely. I can, you can have a little, little boardroom uh, augmentation. Guys, I don't know, if there was a flood there and your suppliers don't deliver that coffee and that mango as you thought, that's a problem. That's a very tactical problem. It's not a utopian strategic far away. Guys, you need to act and react. Okay, let's do it. And then the system can tell you, hey, guys, these floods will continue. Unfortunately, for a while, they will increase across the next two years. We had one per, per, per decade. Now we have two per year. Tiny, but they are pulsing. Either you keep these people down there by insuring them with some kind of a green Bitcoin token, whatever, green token. So you buffer that up. If they overproduce, it goes in. If they underproduce, they take out. You can buy that token for it because that's of the best suppliers you have. If you don't invest them, they will slowly disappear in bankruptcy. So you're saying that's a strategic decision. How the heck could we have known that in that boardroom? But that systems council have the newspaper, every scientific report, and it is superhuman in that sense. But the coolness comes in the empathic symbiosis. That systems understand humans and what we strive for. We don't care about the data in the news. This is the numbers of rain per year. That's stupid numbers, that's information. The system designs that information to become knowledge and gives us the wisdom to take the decision. That's the higher value pyramid there. And we take decision, damn, it will cost a little bit, but the green token investment from us to the 100 farmers down there to that patch, system how much does it give it in the end first it gives you a relationship that is stronger if they fail they will tell you there will be more honesty in your business second you will have a return on that investment in one and a half year and by them planting in that soil the floods will not affect that soil as yeah you everybody knows that shifts of sand can actually create a desert and so on dude you're killing like seven flies in one swat go for it that's augmentation the last a for for everybody and i can tell you if you ask me why this this hollywood dystopian that there's always man versus a machine and for me this english man is also a little bit sticking in my between my ribs we usually you should say human because man is too close to to, to gender uh, you know it's always we rule the world and if we don't we fight machines that's what we do here <laughs> Human versus man, what a stupid idea. How about the opposite? And that's why I formed it, that these two words, because I, what would be opposite to, to man versus, ah, it would be empath, empathy instead. We love each other, we need each other. How? In a symbiosis, it's not we really truly need each, like in biology, but not only mechanically, like in biology, I need your juices, you need, but it is a little bit more empathic. I need these, fit. augment me with your feelings. And, this is what happens. So that's why. That's why I see these four A's. Oh, and, this, this that. and that comes together. And I think the, the, the outcome of that will be that we will forget what work was. was. We will just call it being me. There, there, you know, so you touched on so many wonderful things. Uh, one of them is basically uh, that comes from Lynn Margulis. The symbiosis is a term that she, you know, the symbiotic earth, symbiosis. Uh -huh is one that Lynn Margulis came up with in the 70s. And it's uh, really saying that there is no neoliberalism, no neo-Darwinism, that we're an integra integrated symbiotic earth. And, and this, the other empathy that, that you discuss is really so vital. We need to make <clears throat> business more humane, technology more humane. You know, there's a Kirsten mm -hmm. uh, Harris uh, um, of the uh, Center for Humane to Technology and, you know, the social dilemma and the things that have been coming out about technology and that. But where I like what you what you discuss with uh, this empathy is a lot of the time we hear these stats, these data, see the graphs and yeah. the charts, and, yeah. and and we're like, oh, uh, 
another graph or another 70% or 80% or <laughs> 90% statistic or value uh, or percentage that we see. And we're like, oh, okay. But if we put, put more empathy and connect ourselves to that data, to that value, to tie ourselves into a symbiosis with our earth, what does that graph or chart mean? Then, then we can also react. If it's just, you know, it's like if you see a tiger or a, a lion or, you know, a bear, you're like, holy shit, I got to run away. I got to protect myself. Mm. I've got to do something. There's an action or I've got to, you know, fight or flight. But if you're presented with another climate or, or business graph or chart, you're like, oh, another graph. I saw that in last week's meeting. Yeah. And there's no empathy there's also no relation there's no human behind those numbers and data and i think there's a real easy way and it sounds like the four a's in the way that you're discussing that is to bring it in and not only make it more understandable and make it more empathetic and humane but so that we can say oh now i know what it means it's we're talking yeah. specifically uh, uh, about how we can merge this Ethiopian coffee farmer or this mango farmer in the Amazon that, and, br and bring their data into something that we can really use in a much better system moving forward for humanity. That's kind of what I'm hearing out. And I, I you know, hopefully you didn't misconstrue it, but um, that that's really, uh, I loved it. Thank you so much. This is important. And, and you, yes, thank you for reflecting that because that's important for me to hear as well you know sometimes you just sit there and have your philosophy is about how things could be someone needs to repeat it to you to for, for, for one to 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 see if you at least on the right path <laughs> not even speaking about the right goal uh, and by the way that's an exercise we all should do uh, which connects me to what you just said what i heard this is much more important it's not only to see and understand the numbers and feel for them and that's the empathy to see them in the larger or at least different context. If you only see these numbers, uh, we lost 200 suppliers or whatever, it, it becomes a statistical number. Uh, that's very used, that's data. Data becomes information. Now I informed you. I mean, who the hell wants to be informed? It's so rude. I want, in the, in the worst case, I, I can stand to be told, that's okay. But if you're here to inform me, what are you? Military, you know, <laughs> government official? No, friends don't speak like that to each other. We tell stories and numbers and these things don't tell stories yet. And this is part of the, of the progress I want to make as well, that that plantage there with the mango, with the coffee, whatever you guys do out there, uh, your numbers go up and down, your business is like this or that. What's the story behind? And what's the story in front in a different perspective? For example, human perspective, animal perspective, or just different people's, your ecosystem perspective rather than your business perspective, right? You cannot thrive in a business without an ecosystem. No customers, goodbye. They are your ecosystem, not you. And yeah, you get it. But also a bigger story, how does this affect the world? Uh, I don't know, we can talk about nuclear power um, or, or all these biases we have. For example, uh, nuclear power, power can kill people. It's a dangerous endeavor. At the same time, this is the best chance we have for a little while to not burn coal and oil and, and, and natural gas. That is actually now kicking us in the face. Nuclear power does, but when it does, it's really a strategy. However, it's actually manageable in a way. See, so there is a bias within the back. There is a bigger story in the, in the, in the scary story that is actually bias, yeah. less scary. So I just brought that up because it's, it's so easy and it's so biased. I can just imagine a couple of you listening no, wait a second. And, and you would be right. However, I want these numbers to tell a bigger story. And I think human ingenuity, human perspective, human emotions, you being angry and the other one being agreeing with me, that's okay, guys. That's also a story to be told. But there are numbers and the bigger, think 100 years, not the next two years. Think, think, um, think accidents and what, how it affects the globe and look at coal and then look at, at other numbers. Don't think politics because then maybe that's your bias. Yeah, I belong to that camp. And I think machinery, computers and algorithms can help us to tell these stories. And, and last thing on that, visualization. Um, 
we have been really bad in the usability of knowledge, if you wish. Uh, I need to see pictures. I need to see diagrams with colors that make sense. I want to see comparisons overlapping. I want to see tiny little documentaries about what the numbers are without filmmakers actually to, to you know, have to sweat over a documentary to tell us a beautiful story. Why can't machines show up pictures that, Martin, this is going to happen unless this and this and this. Make, see what I'm saying? That's possible. A, I can make stories up. They can combine moving pictures and voice to tell Absolutely. us stories. And we react to these stories so much faster than tables of numbers, obviously. So again, bring us knowledge, not data. Um, so we can create wisdom and wisdom is this ecosystemic thinking uh, between each other. This is why we're doing it. This is important as well. So I'm, your reflection on my story, I think is exactly giving me the last chunk into that visual, say it, make us feel, make us see, which was the three bullets of my nine bullets of how we create the future. But these are the first one, say it. Uh, Drop, drop, drop the data, drop the information, whatever you have. Make me feel around it, which is put it in a context of, of uh, empathic symbiosis. Make me see so I can go, oh, like now I see. You, you know what? It happens exactly. sometimes. Someone shows you a diagram and you go, never seen it like that. Because seeing is so much faster than reading in 1,000 books. And we can continue. That is also important. That, that's exactly what I do with the sustainable development goals. I show them in a different way than we're used to seeing them. And, and I think that visual way is, is so important. Uh, we, we all learn a little bit different. We try to use, uh, some of us use one sense and others use the others. And some of us use multiple senses to, to make understanding of the world. Some are more visual, some are more, uh, 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 they need to hear it, they need to read it somehow, and uh, they're more apt to, to go with that. You touched on two things that are absolutely vital. So one, our whole purpose with our discussion here today is really to remove bias, to get, to get the bias out. And you, uh -huh. you touched on, on that. And the other is to, to start making sense. So we're on this road to the future. It's going to come whether we want it or not. And it's actually futures, you know, it's a, it's the futures that we will have. Yeah. And, and we can talk more about that. But there's this great thing that uh, Kate Rosworth uh, said, the, the donut economist, uh, so to say, the donut economics uh, super economist um, that everybody's kind of talking about. She said, a lot of the things that we discuss, these graphs, these charts, these things that we mentioned are actually based upon weird societies. Well, you're like, what? Weird, weird society. Well, what, what, that is, what that is, is an acronym. Weird societies are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies. Oh, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and it is here that the most economic research is conducted and thereby it produces a biased response because it's happening in the Western or developed world. Uh, it has a real biased response because we're not the biggest chunk of the pie of that graph or base. You know, there's others who in developing are billions compared to us, a small percentage, but yet we're having a, a humongous influence on, on how the, the world is is working and running and so there, there's one other thing that i kind of really wanted to touch upon what what goes into to what you said is um there's another great writer who writes on climate and society and economics and charles eisenstein i don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with him but um he, he really talks a lot about and, and i really have to thank um Paula, we had a discussion about this and, and how she, you know, kind of enlightened me and put it in her own words, but, you know, and, and as well as Kate Rosworth, um, so, uh, came out and said that, you know, when, when, when people talk about the environment or climate or the symbiosis that you mentioned, or that we're integrally tied to our earth and other species and our planet and these resources, automatically the economists, the capitalists, those people who are the business people, they're like, oh, what? That, this is getting too esoteric. It's getting too uh -huh. touchy-feely. I don't, I don't know what they're saying or how to understand it. It's almost like they squirm or cringe or they're like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is going in the wrong direction. But in, in reality, 
those resources, the way their business, the way the future will survive is dependent not on a resource, not putting a number or boxing someone in as, oh, they're the resource. And as uh -huh. when that resource is depleted, we will move to the next resource. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not resources, but they're relationships. Yes. They're human experiences, relationships, stories, and things that you so eloquently, you know, just said. But when you talked about the, you know, the bias and, and the, the empathy and those things, those are all getting into a new narrative, a new story of how we connect each other and, and say, mm -hmm. no, nope, you're not just a number. You're not just a resource. You're an integral, vital part of my business That's and it. my life. And so I love I loved the fact that, you know, uh, sometimes it's about that language. And you also touched upon that in the beginning as well. So that's that's a, a super observation there and yeah and thanks for emphasizing we, we should have come back to that and now we did uh if you probably remember my my two my one favorite uh, pyramid that i proudly borrowed from someone on the internet thank you someone uh you did this on a napkin sketch i found on google image search data is in the bottom um data by design or whatever, I translate it. If you design data to something, if you work on it a little bit, if you engineer it forward, it becomes information. Nobody wants to be informed, as I said. But if you present data or, or uh, sorry, information in a way, it becomes knowledge. Oh, now I know, now I understand. And that's good stuff. Ped pedagogy and all these things come in there. Storytelling becomes, oh shit, I know, I know. But then if we start to tell these stories more and can use them, can connect these dots between the stories and it becomes a tool for feeling better or doing better it doesn't matter just better yeah? or, or different or for example tomorrow it becomes wisdom wisdom is very abstract but yeah you go and apply your own idea of, of wisdom folks uh, there is a parallel pyramid they are they are twin systems okay and it comes from them that 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 stuff i totally made up so now you can blame me for this one um, I've been watching like, yeah, for a couple of decades, how people make features, engineer features into new stuff. We have an idea, therefore it must be great. You know, basically this, that, that bias. Hey guys, I have an idea, so probably good. Uh, probably, maybe not, you know, so just because you had a feature and engineered this into a product and you made it possible, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's doing things right. But how do you know if that was the right thing through because features needs to be put in that bag and that bag is called products and you put them on the market but this is nothing of that actually really really matters until you ask the question with that product which is goes so features products next step how do you serve it is it of a service to anyone out there uh, and when, when you serve something uh, to 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 your customers for example to a community you will make them having opinions and, 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 and emotions about it and, and whatever. Oh, this was amazing. The latest whatever gadget and so on, or their latest service. Oh, I always wanted to. Oh, now I can, you know, round up my 9.95, the last five cents go to a charity. What a service. Yeah, I have a relationship to it. And that's the top of the pyramid. And this is why, I, you know, janked it out, out of what, what you said, because that's that's the parallel pyramids. I talked about the data before now. And my approach to how this pyramid lives is design relationships, Re engineer these relationships first, the rest will follow. Usually we start with features because we can, because I'm biased towards features because I'm an engineer and she goes, but how about just sit down and say, what relationships do I want to have? With whom? What's my ecosystem? Um, uh, what, is, what is the symbiosis we will create? Hmm. What kind of service could I be of? Or these people to me? What kind of products will enhance or, or be a vehicle for this? What features would they need to have? Now you're talking. So it's a, it's a forward, uh, forward, a little bit like pay forward. We start with relationships. The rest will I think that's the easy part. We, we can read a book. Uh, we will know how to, or we will invent it. But we need to know not only how to do things right, we need to know uh, what things are the right things to do. And that comes from, from this relationship. And I think 
building relationships and having a great imagination. So two business activities we have forgotten. And obviously in my vision work for SAP or future of work, I always ask these things, you know, uh, how, how, what relationships are you here for to create and serve to the world? And if you're good, have a good business model, there is yeah, maybe don't agitate uh, around all that. You will make money. Congratulations, man. And the second, where is your imagination department? Who leads that? Where is the head of that? What? And, and yeah, a little bit like I alluded to, no, wait, mm -hmm, what? And we need to start that. So we need designers and philosophers in your boardrooms, uh, not only feature makers and, and you know, dot counters. Uh, so that, that's a different approach. And that goes a little bit with these biases, the, the weird society, the, 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 maybe that the form of capitalism or capital or resource that we have been used to. And the bias towards that, that is an answer, which leads another one hour. If you always think you have an answer, you, you yeah, you will be wrong many, many times. Yeah, many, many times. So, 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 so having an idea, having a perspective, have a spectrum, this is the general idea that I think we should investigate. That's better because saying neoliberalism is the answer. Well, yeah sometimes <laughs> until it's not and it's you since the world is changing neoliberalism is not so much it's capitalism it's not so much then it will become less and less right in the end it will be very very wrong if you still stick to it everything that follows that will be very wrong and I, yeah you get the point guys it's actually that easy so look for emergence instead of your answer looks for complexity complexity instead of something historically correct um, not even equi equilibrium is correct. Oh, I measured these things and these things. When we do this and this, we have balance in our business. Yes, for now, every weight will be weighted differently. There will be different kinds of things coming on your scale. Complexity prevails, emergent complexity and evolution prevails. Optimizing is great. Evolution, we screw that up too for you. So be prepared for complexity, com emergent complexity and evolution planning great for the next three weeks but don't plan for five years man we saw that collapsing into during the soviet era pretty well yeah we need to learn from that guys be open recombine instead of being rational about this is it no remix man be the dj of your life instead of the you know let's follow mozart that's the score follow it no <laughs> yeah you you get you, you see where i'm heading i i totally get it i mean there are so many cross crossovers as well so not only um are you know going back I, I because i absolutely i'm a big fan of lynn margulis and symbiosis and the symbiotic earth and mm. um and then you've talked about these ecosystems um <clears throat> well they're really about relationships they're about connecting us to our earth to the resources they're about it doesn't mean we're going back to the dark ages it means that we're uh, uh, having an evolution you use the word evolution so for humans to have an evolution takes millions to billions of years except when it's a cultural evolution cultural evolution is one that can kind of almost get up to speed on on, on an exponential path or a very quick path for us to evolve in a different way, but it has to do with those relationships, those stories, that ecosystem, that symbiosis, and the the really emerging message that has been coming out for decades now, and it is really uh, coming to head. And it's it's probably the next century will be uh, the, the next topic is really regenerative. So regenerative economies, regenerative societies, regenerative cities, ecosystems, um, because we're connecting ourselves as a symbiose to our ecosystem, to our earth, to uh, others, um, and making those relationships. And now we've got this regenerative culture and society, which is on an exponential path to meet the future that the earth needs to live on to live within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. What, how, can, how can a company be a regenerative company? Yeah. How can they do that? that? That's a thing, but it involves the things that you all discussed. Symbiosis, ecosystem, 
complexity, systems thinking, remixing. I mean, there's that whole re-imperative, reuse, recycle, yeah, repurpose, regenerate, you know, on and on that uh, I, I, you just keep touching on these. They're not buzzwords anymore. They're the new nope. language of the future of business. It's a regenerative economy. It's a regenerative society so that we will always have that abundance that you discussed mm -hmm. so that we'll always have plenty without being at the cost of someone else or, or, or uh, 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 of our safe operating spaces of where we live, our home. And it's interesting not being cost of someone else. You, you, you framed it. Um, and I, I'm, what I'm hope for in, in the next decade or so, I hope it's going to take less than a decade, but sometimes we're surprised. If you see of yourself of being of a cost for someone else, I can, I can see obviously that that can be true in a short-term perspective. However, in a long-term perspective, we may be or biased to see this uh, wrongly. Uh, because that would mean that you're not acting in an ecosystem. Because acting in an ecosystem cannot be a cost. Because if it is, it's by definition not an ecosystem. You're just draining someone else's ecosystem. And that's the difference. Oh, we are cost to that ecosystem. No, if that's true, you're not part of it. Sorry, <laughs> you're still in your ecosystem. That's cool. As soon as you realize that and connect, it's the re rescale, remix, uh, regenerate. And I love the book uh, Unfragile, on Unfragility. Oh, I forgot the title, Unfragile. Yeah, Anti-fragile, wasn't it? Anti-fragile, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that was uh, a great book. Uh, that's a great book because uh, the, 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 the writer goes in and says, hey, I just couldn't find a word because resilient is good. It means whatever comes my way, I stand up. I have structural integrity, whatever that would mean for a person, for an ecosystem and so on, to survive these blows. I'm, I'm uh, resilient. And I don't think it's enough. Uh, it must be a little bit like these superheroes in the, 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 the Hollywood movies, when they gain energy from someone else's blow, it comes a blow to, to, to the face, boom. And she's down on the ground, but it's some kind of a kinetic magic energy from Mars that makes her rise up, doubled it. I mean, wasn't Hulk a little bit like that? The more you piss him off, the stronger yeah. he got. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the negative side of the story. But what I'm looking for is the positive uh, uh, anti-fragile, which means if you test us as an ecosystem, in a way, we, we take that data to information, to knowledge, to a wisdom, to reapply um, to a new experience in the future of a service to the same ecosystems. We build in new features to never be surprised by that again. And that's anti-fragile, that's positive fragile, uh, which we don't still don't have a word for. We need to invent one. Anti-fragile is still anti. Anyway, so I like that. And I think ecosystemic thinking must be the start of that. You don't belong there if you cost someone something. And I, again, I'm not stupid, I'm not naive. I understand that we do cost ecosystems and people something and that's a loan. And then we go into a relationship. I promise to pay you back somehow. Uh, it could be a business, could be an environmental uh, question, whatever. But it must be this kind of reciprocal thing because we moved from sort of a collectivism, uh, uh, us and them, from the whole history of, of, of human, getting grown-ups here on this planet from hunter-gatherers and so on this tribe that tribe more money less money i'm the king you're not it's a collective that's not our collective that's another collective that's the peasants and we are the you know louis the whatever it's collectivism that was the thing and then we went all the way to nationalism and and whatever collectivism in in, in uh, some some experiments in common that then blew up in, oh no, let's go the other way. Individualism, neoliberalism, I am, I am. Where do you not? You can't be unless you are with others. The, the saddest thing that could happen ever to a human being, be stranded on earth alone. Here you go, it's all yours now. Have fun, stupid. No, individualism doesn't work because if you take it to the far end, obviously you're wrong. There must be individuality. I would like to call it human uniqueness, okay? A me, a strong in, me with integrity. Know yourself, love yourself. Uh, be yourself, contribute as only you can. 
but that is only good as you did just a couple of, of a dozen of minutes ago you reflected what i say we need to be reciprocal by reflection that's called conversation that's called relationship building again so from capital to to entrepreneurship which reflects individualism right i am the entrepreneur you i have you don't so i sell you buy that's the economical model of i don't know how many hundred years uh, we, we need to go for, to, to inclusion to ecosystemic reciprocal fulfillment thinking it's not my individual freedom or or whatever kind of in socialism would be a, a total equity for everybody it's fulfillment is this me does it fulfill me if it does then i'm a stronger member of this community therefore i'm not a cost or a burden i'm just changing the community community by using its resources or the community as a resource since i'm a member in it i automatically give it back because now i am a better me in that community so that's my circle going around in these inclusions looking not for capital but solutions okay uh, not uh, not using labor and, and to distribute labor as a resource, but to, to to beam it out into an ecosystem, to, to share it in such a way that we all can be individuals, but in an ecosystem. Corporation, recombination, evolution and emergence in complex system comes to your mind. And that's scary shit. It, it's easier to be an entrepreneur, say, that's the market, I'm going into market, I'm doing shit, then I'm going out. That's easy, I know it works. But that's not the full story and we see the effects of that both for our economy our politics and our planet today and we see their reactions this is why i believe the cultural change will be exponential we're just lacking the political means now the ideas and the words we're using touching all of that we need to now be available a little bit of mandate a little bit of money and such stuff to go with the political tools to change the next decade and that will be my full circle to, to, to talk about ecosystems now or systemic design. I totally agree. So, I mean, there's, <clears throat> we've seen, you know, not only in the last decade, but specifically in the last 12 months, this, this huge dis-ease around the world that um, our, our civilization frameworks that we have, whether it doesn't matter whether we're in Europe or in the United States or in, in Brazil or, or in Russia, or in China, um, they yeah. are are tending not to work for us anymore. We're feeling much disease in, in humankind that, um, and especially during this uh, global uh, pandemic that a lot of the problems have bubbled to the surface. There's been a microscope shown in to show us where the problems in the systems or half, half systems that, that exist out there are that need to be fixed or uh, where the problems are, but there's this unrest, this disease that we're like, boy, these these frameworks, these okay. policies, they're just not working for us anymore. And so now, how do we keep that framework, that plate spinning and up while we transition to maybe, you know, regenerative economy, another ecosystem with some of the tools that you discussed, and and I and we don't necessarily need to get get into that, but I think that that is you know once we can remove the bias and 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 also make sense of that, there's got to be a new global operating system or a framework for humanity that really works for everyone in the world, and and uh, this really leads to two of my hardest questions for you, but I know you're a pro at them because I actually <laughs> I actually get one of them from you. Um, and it is the burning question. It's the burning question, WTF, mm. what's the future? So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I want you, uh, you usually ask this question and, yeah. and kind of also <laughs> answer it, but, but Martin, wh what is the future? Yeah, besides being in an action sport, if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right, because then you don't learn. That's that's one. That, that's the funny one. Uh, however, it connects to what you said very quickly, and I understand that you placed this question after your reflection, which is, how can we continue spin this positive spiral? Because there are obstacles in our way. Yeah. And I think the obstacle is uh, the creative confidence for the future. We don't have it. We have a bias of outsourcing the future, and that that that's something I I have been thinking and working on to 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 tear down. 
there are, oh, there's so many aspects to this. One, for example, there is no one future. Future is a plural. It just doesn't have th that S in the end. Every time you say future, you mean many. Actually, theoretically, uh, uh, what do you say? Infinite amount. That's what you actually mean, folks, uh, when you listen to this. In the future, ah, you mean all the possible futures. Because if you say, if you actually use the future in singular, you just outsource that to someone else to define which one of them will happen. And if you didn't, you better have an idea which one it is, because then you may be taking actually your accountability to create one. And now I want you to hold it accountable for what you're gonna say about it. In the future, yes, we're listening to see if you just outsource it or you're just totally unaware of how futures happen. Or if you actually have a positive, impactful idea that you will drive as an accountable for that. So that's the first perspective, futures, or ours. They have not happened yet, and there are infinite amount of possible uh, variants of them. Which one is yours? To, to go into this kind of chaotic and pressurized can of, of you know, possibilities and, and, and hard work, you need to have confidence to go in there creatively, not afraid. And that creative confidence we are lacking today because we biased towards outsourcing. First, we outsource this to, to all sorts of uh, myths and gods and religions and authorities of other kind, any authority, magical or not, okay? Uh, totally made up or not. Kings and countries and nationalities and flags and colors, pick one. The future will be, oh yeah, ask that guy. And, and it's always a man. It's only, you know, just by, by default because our patriarchal societies have been like that mostly in all cultures, uh, almost. Now, then we had brands and yeah, Apple would make the future, Google will pick one. Yeah, SAP will create the future, uh, which is not true. We need to go in with that confidence. I think that's the burning question for, this is how I translate, what's the future? That's a question. It cannot be totally answered, but the, the, the question is the job to be done to create an idea what it could be. I mean, you need to, we need to guys to take, to start to tell these stories, to compare them. That's the discussion, that's relationship building. Confidently enough that go into the crazy, crazy idea that we don't know, but we can figure out together the science of futures. Another thing we did, even without the outsourcing the future to, to magical, uh, invisible friends uh, of ours and to, to visible uh, friends that has magical authorities like countries and kings and so on. They, they are just human as you, by the way. Anyway, we started to outsource the future even, so that's the farthest outsourcing to, to, to some kind of a religious uh, figure. We started to outsource them to our kids. Okay, when I'll die, all of this will be yours. What, dad, what of this? It's the forest is on fire, dude. I don't want that. What's wrong with you? This uh, macroeconomical system is eating itself from inside. You really? You, that's what you're giving to me? Or, okay, I took the worst examples. There's some beautiful, wonderful things that we have achieved today because of that system and these beliefs and so on. Guys, again, I'm not naive. I'm just saying why it's wrong, not why it's right, because there's some things we always need to change. We outsource them to our kids. So our kids are so aware, have such a relationship to us. They can jump up and slap us in the face and say, no, I don't want. And we've seen that examples of that happening as well. Not only Greta, but all the, uh, all the voices out there that come up. So the big circles of future creation, my near future, which is what the agriculture gives us the first future thing. I don't know when future was invented, but the future is an invention. Oh, wait a second, there's a thing after this. Let's call that future. I don't know when it happened. Anthropologists out there, Help us uh, write to, to Mark. I really want to know. I'm Come serious. On, David get, get the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the, get the debate going. I want you to listen to us and reach out. If you want contacts, give us. Someday future was created by some guy sitting there looking at his potatoes. In the future. <gasps> Shit, what did I say? That. And all of a sudden, that was my future. That, but the kids were... No, that's, that's there. Yeah, see what I'm saying? That was another bubble. That's these circles of futures possible never met. And then the, the totally untouchable, the, the nationality, for example, it's just an abstract, the, 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 the religion, whatever, we can go forever. That was a yet another one. Oh, that's not up to us, honey. Now all these three are blurring. They became possible futures. 
how can you be confident enough with all your purpose, all your freaking ikigai walking into that and say, I have confidence enough to start at least unpack that. And maybe I have uniqueness to contribute to that. So I am the authority. However, the strong me that is growing up of this thinking, like for Greta Thunberg or whoever is out there, actually, and you yourself, you're an ambassador for the SDGs for you and Mark. That's congratulations and thank you for doing that job. And everybody else that, 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 that listens to you and have the same mission, not only passion and, and purpose. You guys, you grow up to the strong me. I call it this concept of me. We are leaving authorities, we're becoming our own authorities. This goes back to augmentation technology and future of work. Let's not re go back to that. However, back to our reciprocal system, the fulfillment the ecosystem. You are nothing unless you're good for something. If you're good only for you, good luck having fun. There will be no movies to go to, no books to read about it from other people. See what I'm saying? You are only the reflection of yourself in others. And I always use the right a me in the air with capital letters. Draw a line like a mirror, drop it like on a hinge. You get a we very quickly. You need to reflect yourself. And as, as you do, you can only do it in others. You become a we. And that is the biggest authority. We will, the individual is work very effectively for us. We have capital. And we can sort of a little bit distribute it, but far from enough. The trickle down didn't work. Sorry, Reagan Thatcher, screw you. That actually really screws up in the long run. We have to have a stronger we that is about fulfillment and solutions. No, it's, it's inclusion, it's cooperation, it's recombination of our many me's. Now I'm confident to be strong me so I can create my own future, but that's useless until I do it with each other's. That's my full, sort of a little bit lengthy answer to why I see why we are so afraid of the future. We have the bias of me. We have the bias of unconfidence. We have the bias of magical authorities, <laughs> you know, magical invisible friends. And uh, we have the bias, what do I matter? Uh, and if we start to work on these biases, I think we can move between me and we uh, symbiosis between the augmentations from machines, we augment machines, machines augment us to a, to a cooperation or co-action if you wish. The, this decade will be very interesting, man. Very interesting. And, and I just wanna to touch, I mean, you, you said it eloquently, but I wanna uh, highlight a few things. So it is, it is definitely the we, but what I hear out as well, we're part of this ecosystem that you're discussing. We're part of an integral part, the symbiotic part of that. And that's why it is we. And when we come to that realization, it's not me, it's we, and we're in this together, that um, we have much more empowerment to make changes, to do that exponential uh, cultural evolution, to, to reach these futures, very desirable futures, as well, uh, and, and that there is a hint, and you kind of tickled on it a couple of times that sometimes we feel small or we feel too alone or, or to do it. But um, that theory has been proven wrong and wrong and wrong over and over again. That try sleeping in a room with a mosquito. Think about how minuscule <laughs> and small the coronavirus is. It's smaller mm. than a strand of hair, it's smaller than a grain of sand, it's smaller than a piece of dust, yet it's had an exponential impact around the world. And, and there's thousands, numerous, millions of other examples <clears throat> where little things together in the we uh, can have a very huge impact when we realize we're part of this big symbiotic earth, this, this uh, uh, bigger picture. And so I, I like how um, you really frame that. And, and then the last is, is really, we're not passengers on this spaceship earth. We actually can each take a hand on the steering wheel towards those futures and guide how we're gonna get there. And, and, and uh, I, I guess the bigger framework would be is, you know, if you don't have a map, a plan or goal or a, a, a rough understanding of what the futures are, or how, how, what the plan is to get there, then you'll never get there because you're just going to let someone else deliver those futures to you wherever you live. 
And so yeah. it, uh, grab that steering wheel, please. Be part, be part of all those, those, and, and I, and it, they're not buzzwords. It's the new language of the, the regenerative. It's this new language that you are part of that. And, and uh, yeah. you, you, my listeners are very lucky because Martin just <laughs> let the cat out of the bag. He's just put it all on the table on how, how we can create a better future, uh, futures, and, and get there and, and put it in, into a way that only he can say it so eloquently. Um, I, I do have a couple more questions, and then we will we will wrap it up because we could talk for hours. You know this. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we had. I mean, what was it? A three four hour car ride, and, and yeah, it was quite long. Yeah. You, you had to say, "Shut up! I need to take a take a nap. I'm, I'm I have to work when I get land and and." Uh, um, because we could talk about forever, not only about the books and the philosophies and the theories, but we we like to discuss the future and, and, and are both uh, futurists. Uh, for me, it plays a big role in, in the climate and environment. Uh, uh, the future is a big, big part of that. Um, the, the, the last three questions I really have uh, are, are half and half there they've all been for my listeners to kind of give them empowerment and help them on their path in this period of rediscovery this period of of finding the new futures that we're working towards so that whenever we emerge from the pandemic and lockdowns that we'll actually quickly get this cultural evolution underway to to reach these futures but you often say in a lot of your talks and discussions and it's not, I hope, uh, it's not just meant for businesses, uh, but it's meant for all of us. Why are, are you relevant in 10 years from now? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, 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 that's fantastic. That's, that's my question. And, and it scares the hell out of people. And I, and I usually actually say, I usually speak into uh, audiences or have discussions with, with business people, uh, that, that's for sure. However, every business person, she's a, a, a human sitting there. <laughs> and if you, I don't know, try to turn to, to, to someone where you're waiting for the bus, they will run from you like they've seen a ghost. If you just turn around, why are you relevant 10 years from now? That's, that's a horror movie for them. They will not take that bus with you because it's such a deeply investigative, intruding question. It is, right? Uh, especially when I have this follow-up, because if you can't describe it for me in one sentence, you risk not being relevant 10 years from now. For businesses, this is a little bit milder because you have that time and the community to go there together, your ecosystem, also your partners, your academia, your customers. Uh, for a single person, that can be really scary. Um, however, it is still true. I claim it is true. If you cannot even start to unpack that, that bag of, of goodies. Why are you relevant uh, 10 years from now? It touches uh, who are you, what's your purpose, what's, uh, uh, what's, what's, what mission are you on right now, doing the right things, doing them right, and in that order, not the vice versa, running in circles. Uh, if you can't do that, you, you run actually a risk to be handed the future, okay? So for me, that's a practical question. It's like a tool to the theory of you are a future creator. So if you want to get started uh, about this theoretical, hypothetical stuff that we've been touching upon, sometimes philosophical, and you think, yeah, but what can I do on Monday morning? That's a classic uh, conference from a business moderator question. What can these executives do on Monday morning? I'll tell you, yeah, ask you that question and start answering that. Um, how? Pen and paper. Uh, use your favorite language. I don't care dance it but you need to be able to express it uh write it down do it uh, this and start start uh make it easy on yourself start to answer the question with it is possible that i might think i would guess and such expressions so because if you think you can answer that question you're really fooling yourself nobody else <laughs> there is no answer to that question that will last for the next 10 years forget it because the future is faster than that. It's more exponential. And again, back to complexity. However, put an intention there. This is, and you start it, and here's another tool. Start by describing the relationships you will have. And coming back, you see it's coming together, guys. 
uh, this, now we're getting practical. Now we're going into a workshop to create futures, which I do so often. You have done it many times as well, Mark. We all have our tools. This is, this is one of mine. Start to ask why you're relevant 10 years from now. What relationships will you have? Oh, relation. if you were to describe relationship, you can at least imagine with whom, right? With yourself only? No. Ah, so put these people and entities and things on that paper as well. I don't know, draw them. Is there in a circle, in a triangle? I don't know, are they in your home? It's, it's fun, do it. However, spend time. And most of this will be biased because you are and you come from, you extrapolate from who you are. I find some of the things, at least half of them, I suggest this is next tool, you must imagine. So there are things that don't really exist, but could exist in your life or other people's lives, or actually on this planet, if you wish, you know. Uh, flying cars was an imagination, although cars existed. So there was this 50 extrapolations, 50, no, that's totally crazy. Humans flying, or as, yeah, you get the point. You need to imagine. Um, we call it the third horizon of innovation. And folks, if you, if you think your incremental bettering of everything uh, is uh, all of the innovation there is, you're wrong, that's the first horizon. Maybe sometimes it's a backlog, to be honest, in industry terms. Second one is the extrapolation. If we can do this, if we take it a little bit further, we maybe can do that building on this. That's the second horizon. The third one is, as I usually say, if you, if you can extrapolate or, or forecast to the third horizon, it's by definition, not the third horizon, because then you're still in the second. You're just extrapolating. Bankers are great with that. Uh, I'm, I want to... What are you relevant to nearest from? I want you to imagine the world that it exists in that. And it's you will play a significant and positive role in that. You, because you are the only me that can do it. Of the 10 billion living on this planet, 10 years from now, you're the only me that can do that. How will you connect to other me? So you become a we. You see, use the tools we have touched upon in this in this conversation and put them together. And I tell you, it will not only be not scary because that's the first step. That's my mission, guys, have a confidence. It's, it's gonna be so much fun. The things you will say and discover. By the way, if you bring other people into that room while you're doing this, the, the, now we start, now we're having fun again. So, so that's my- why That's when you bring the relationship and the ecosystem really into it. And it really, you're so right, it becomes fun. You, uh, you, <laughs> You're amazing. You're the wizard, you know, the, the wizard, <laughs> uh, the wizard of uh, uh, Wazkowski. So I, I absolutely uh, love how you say that. Um, there, there are some crazy things there that I, I almost have to comment on a little bit. Um, not only is there this third horizon in you so eloquently, and we're talking about master classes, we're talking about workshops. Yeah that takes days. And so this is a lot where your guys are, are, are very lucky to get this type of depth and substance because even in that third horizon, there's a third dimension. And then there's something that Martin and I talk about as well as the slingshot effect, which oh, yeah. is, is the gravitational pull of humanity when we get together in a line that's very similar to the gravitational effect of used by satellites and, and, and space adventurers uh, over and over again. So, I mean, there's some things that you, you touched on that are amazing. There's one more comment though. I have a good friend, his uh, name's John P. Strelenke. And uh, we have many good friends that, that are kind of, uh, we know through Future IO, Harold and many others, but John P. Strelenke, he's uh, an author. He lives in Florida. He's uh, been around for a long time. Uh, he sells a book every 26 minutes in Germany, at least when we're not in lockdown. Uh, the Y Cafe, The Big Five for Life, um, Jungle, and, and, and many other greats. But he said something that is, is very interesting, and it reminds me of you, Martin, because you're, you're such a wonderful person and the wisdom that you depart. You didn't answer my question when I said, <laughs> why do you do it? What's your mission or purpose? But it's because... You're passionate about the topic. You love it. You want to see a better future. You want to help us deliver those better futures. And you know it's the we. Uh, that's kind of what I extrapolate out of it. The reason I bring up John P. Strelecki, he said, if, if you've, you've got the right questions, you know, what's the futures? 
uh, are you relevant 10 years from now? If you figured out your why and kind of done some self-discovery of where you want to go, he says, the most important thing is then to find the who, who meaning who has already done that, who's already living those futures, who's already mm. in that job or that evangelist or that position or that expert or that author who's already done that. And mm. uh, you are one of those who that I can definitely go to and, uh, and ask. And I would suggest for all my listeners that if you have a passion in a certain area or uh, have a desire to develop or grasp that bigger ecosystem thinking and that symbiosis, find those who's, those people who have been doing it for a while. And Martin is definitely there. And that leads me to my final questions for you. And they're actually for my, for my listeners um, to, to kind of empower them and, and, and make them, them better. If there was one message you could depart to, to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? Mm. It is as simple as you are right now creating a future. Do you like it? I love That's it. it. I love That's it. it. That's fine. You're I right will, now doing this. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Ah, okay. Um, there, there, there's that. There's two answers. Um, That's fine. Uh, one is if if you want to be very tangible and go quickly and make an impact right now, look at the problems to be solved. Think like an engineer. Give me problems. Uh, and be bold when you say that to people. Uh, even take other people's problems out of their from their shoulders. Uh, that they will love you for that. Uh, so that's one way. Don't take too much, though. You know, walking around with other people's monkeys on your shoulders can be a little bit of a burden sometimes. <laughs> but you, you get my point. Look for look for trouble and solve it. Uh, be be that kind of a rebel. The second one is if you're an innovator and so thinking about futures. Um, I, I love the, the, the explanations that, you know, the, for me, future is a space, like a mental space. It's a physical space. Uh, vision is a space. If I tell you a story, a narrative, I imagine, hey, can you imagine this, Mark? And I go ahead. That you, you have that in your mind, because this is how language works. This is why how wonderful apes we are. We can share that with each other uh, beyond death, even by writing books and theater and dances and everything. So the future is a space. And as an inventor, as a young innovator, um, consider this good old say, saying from, from uh, what's his name, Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, the future, future is a space, it's a resource as well. It's like, I don't know, like water, um, distribute it. And the best, the simplest way you can do it, talk about it. This could happen in the future. I'm an innovator, I'm young. I have long time to create many desirable futures. I am doing it right now by talking to you. Here's a story I would like to share. By doing that, you share a space and a resource. And that's, that's ecological. <laughs> that's economy thinking. That's great, dude. Do that uh, as soon as you can. So first, be a problem solver, even for other people's problems. Then you're doing great. Second, uh, take the opportunity to share that space. Even if it's, it's only in your head, go around and tell other people because they will find both problems and solutions in that spaces. They, you will also give them confidence. You have the confidence to imagine that. Now I also do. We share space together. We share that resource future. It's more evenly distributed. That's what you should do. That reminds me of something that Carl Sagan said. It's basically <clears throat> the second part of what you said that we are a way for the cosmos, for the universe to know itself. And, and I truly, uh, I truly kind of, uh, I really agree with what you said and you said it so beautifully. The last question is um, all I have for you today, unless you left something out that you wanna tell us, but what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you wish you would have known from the start? 
Uh, oh man, <laughs> that one, right? Um, I mean, one way to answer the question, nothing, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Everything I learned was a, yeah, that, that learning, that evolution, emergence, don't plan. We've been there, right? We, we just said it before. So that, that's one way to answer that. Um, however, uh, there is a gut feeling uh, we all have. Um, and this is a little bit of the creative confidence. I'm coming back to that. Um, I wish I knew that it was it when I felt it. Instead of all the times you, you guys holding back, especially the young innovators, uh, wherever you come from, right? It, it, it is, there will be a resistance. Make that resistance, make that friction a creative one rather than the destructive friction. I wish I knew that earlier that when I am resisting and I am maybe the destructive friction is because I have a passion. I just haven't uncovered or defined it or put it in the right world. So now I'm the, the, the breaking uh, matter. Uh, think about it. If it's, if it's friction, if it doesn't feel good, is it creative or is it destructive? Can you affect it? And sometimes, most of the time, and here's the tip, you're probably right. You actually could be right. Assume that. You could do something good. It's just a bias in people around you that doesn't see it in you uh, yet. You don't see it in you. You're freaking 14. You, you just, you know, went, went out of some kind of bias, biased girls' school that gives you, smashes information uh, or data into your head. You go out and you go, that doesn't feel right. Is it me or is it them? It's probably them. That's what, that's what I would leave you with. <laughs> Thanks so much, Martin. That's all I have, unless you wanted to part any other words of wisdom before I tell you goodbye, but I really appreciate your time. It's so good to see you, and uh, I hope we can do another catch up very soon. Wonderful, Mark. Thank you for taking me on another car ride, which was like five years ago, three hours with naps and everything. Again, uh, deep naps, and so much have happened. But some things never change. And it is the, the, the positive, hungry outlook for the many, many possible futures that we would like to be desirable. And this is the journey we're on. Thank you for taking us on that journey again. You're most welcome. Thank you. It's been a sure pleasure. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Peace. Thank you.